Uh, good afternoon. I'm Shozab Nakvi. I'm a solutions architect at Electric Cloud. I've been in the DevOps space for, actually before it was called DevOps, it may have been called virtualization or automation or cloud services um, in various capacity. Um, I've been a developer, scrum master, team lead, architect, and I've been designing and building software to help enterprises and organizations transition to DevOps and virtualize their systems and, and do as much automation as they can. So the goal for today's talk is to help get the discussion started around how do you build secure pipelines and so you can avoid some of the, I guess, disasters we've seen the last couple of months right, in the news, of course. Um, to level set today's discussion, I've chosen three case studies that kind of highlight some of the failures in process that could have been avoided if security was baked into their pipeline. So the first one is so common, I'm sure you've seen it like a thousand times already, Equifax, right? The failure, of course, is the inability to identify and the unable to automatically auto patch vulnerabilities in production. Second case is of a software vendor called Avis, who, and this is pretty unique. Um, this is where the attackers, not only, they said, you know, forget about the individual, let's go attack the supply chain. So whenever someone would go download software, antivirus software from their website, they were also downloading the malware along with it. And whenever someone would auto update their software, along with it came the malware. And finally, it's Viacom. And this is a good example of failure to, or inability to enforce compliance. This is where I think about one gigabyte's worth of data of credentials, puppet scripts, um, server information was publicly available for you and I to download on their S3 bucket accounts. So how can you use the pipeline to kind of avoid some of these um, uh, uh, issues of vulnerability that easily could have been avoided using pipelines. So before I begin, traditionally, of course, security has always been something that has been towards the tail end of software development. You know, once the developers have checked in code, they've done their applications, they've done their testing, they've done their unit tests, they've sent it over to QA, QA has done their things, operations has kind of, um, spun up infrastructure, installed operating systems, and installed, you know, whatever, a patch, um, libraries and patches. Then at the end, we're like, all right, time for security. By that time, you only have one day, two days left before the deadline. So any vulnerabilities that were discovered will either be over, were either being ignored, because we know at the end, um, software needs to be released. And also, any vulnerabilities that were being discovered in, let's say, production or pre-prod, it's a lot more expensive to, to fix it in those environments rather than, let's say, if they're discovered, for example, in implementation or testing. So the need for constant, for security to be a constant um, process, it's almost, it has to be there now, right? So, and these paradigm shifts, we've seen so many of these, right? When we transitioned from waterfall to agile, we began to understand the benefits of conversion, convergence and parallel processes, right? It became apparent, right, where, where these sort of conversions um, were very beneficial for application planning. So naturally we transitioned to DevOps where two competing silos, you know, Dev and Ops converge on um, common, common goals. So the adoption of Agile and DevOps methodologies led to an interesting, something very interesting. It redefined the definition of teams and it also redefined what success meant. So teams started to become smaller in nature, co-located and decoupled. Again, naturally, AppDev itself is now shifting toward microservices, cloud native development where releases are smaller in size, independent, decoupled, and obviously shorter releases. So convergence has been a common theme throughout these changes. So, back in the day, or even now, monoliths, developers were responsible for that first stack, the app. How do I check in code, I unit test, I package it, and I'm done. Then IT ops would come in and they would thin up infrastructure, install it, and do all that good stuff, right? Then info, working with obviously with info security. But 
as cloud native application and containers and all that came into play, developers were now building infrastructure. They were doing some of the responsibility of security as well because not only were they doing app, now they're putting together bits and pieces of you know, uh, the operating system as part of their container. Uh, they were also adding uh, or you know, installing libraries and packaging them, up, packaging them up as container images. So how do you include security and compliance without being a blocker and affecting release dates? So obviously we all know about the concept of shifting left. So security, we all know has to shift left. But the question is, how do you do it? Security starts from planning. You embed your security experts as part of your scrum team. So now when you're planning, when you do your estimates, you're not just estimating, oh, this is how long it's gonna take me to write my code, and this is how, how much it's gonna take me to do my unit test, this is how much it's gonna take me to do um, you know, my deployments or whatever, but now you're also including this is how long it's going to take us to do security for this particular piece. So now the expectation isn't like it includes the security piece, right? So that's where you start to converge security on the coding level, at the build, at the build stages, at the testing stages, and obviously at the release stages. And the only way you can do that is obviously you need to start baking in into your CI CD process um, security from inception. And like all other tasks in your pipeline, it too must be automated and streamlined so it doesn't become that bottleneck. Your pipeline is in a very unique um, position. So it already has access to all your automation tools, right? It already has access to all the deployment servers. It has access to any other data endpoints that are needed in your overall deployment. So it's in the perfect position to be that enabler of security end to end. The pipeline can converge three key components of your security, centralizing on visibility, traceability, and compliance. So this is an interesting thing, and I see this so, so often, where people have no visibility in, into their pipeline. So this is requirement number one is visibility. Your pipeline should not be a black box where artifacts go in and shiny, little, shiny applications come out. How do you know if you suffer from a black box pip pipeline? Let's say in your process right now, you get an email notification that says, hey, I'm a developer maybe, here's my package, can you now deploy this into QA, right? And if you can't confidently answer any of these questions, then guess what? You suffer from a black, a black box pipeline, right? The pipeline can only converge on visibility, traceability, and compliance if you know all the tasks that run inside your pipeline and you have access to the results, right? Did, they ta did it fail, did it pass? So you can create conditionals based on those tasks. I'm not going to go to my next task unless I know this task passed, or if this task failed, I know I'm gonna take this branch uh, in order to continue my, my pipeline. You need to converge in order to create automated gates in your pipeline and, and to take actions based on the certain results. For example, kicking off an automated workflow based on the results of your security scan. And finally, and of course, everything must be logged and tracked. So we're gonna take two approaches to kind of answering this whole security piece. One is preventative. What can you do to reduce security breaches? And recovery, what steps can I, do, can I take to reduce mean time to recovery? The first step is obviously you need to redefine your pipeline. Developers and security experts must work independently, but in parallel, right? So as soon as a developer checks, checks in code, have their code run through static code analysis. Make sure it runs through unit tests. Verify it has adequate quote coverage. And then create a feedback loop. If it doesn't make, meet the needs, send it back. Listen, you checked in code, but however, we have this issue. So here it is again, check it in again, fix those issues before we package it up. However, and not however, but at the same time, make sure security is also validating base images Right, making sure that existing configurations and new configurations don't add any vulnerabilities into the process because at the very end, those base images are going to be used in the CI process. So when it comes time, comes time to building images, the code and the base image has gone through a rigorous process. New images should be scanned. So now that you built this image, that new image should be, again, scanned, broken down, 
to verify that, hey, have I used the base image that was Info Security kind of said, hey, I should be using? Two, am I using any libraries that may cause some violations that don't follow standards or policies? And of course, if they do, reject the pipeline, stop the pipeline, notify all, everyone that, you know, notify the individuals who are responsible for that pipeline, as well as the developer who may have checked in something that may have caused a violation. So your pipeline becomes, essentially becomes a, an off, a cop that enforces compliance. Everything mentioned in the pipeline should be automated. So I have something listed here, static code analysis, base image validation, container security scans, environment vulnerability scans, pen testing, vulnerability monitoring, and always, always verify compliance. The use of gates are elemental to secure a pipeline, but if you have, but make sure you use gates that actually work, right? You don't want teams there's no point in having a gate where teams kind of circumvent the issues. I'll give you an example. We had this one um, client that was using Sonar Cube was a requirement. So developers were using Sonar Cube, of course, but the settings were set to none. So yes, it was using it was running Sonar Cube, but there was no real validation being done. So we'll kind of explain how you can actually check to see, hey, I'm running a test case, but does it really meet the requirements of my of testing? So guardrails and gates should be used in your pipeline to build confidence in, in the artifact and the process overall. Ideally, it should be automated. Always have gates set up before entering or exiting a stage in your pipeline. And also, these gates should check for readiness. Now, I have some examples of some common gates you should, be, you should have. Obviously, the readiness one is making sure you've passed all the guardrails, testing the test cases have failed or not, oh, you know, failed or, or have passed, make sure the, the test case fulfilled policy, right? It's not just empty, you know, sonar queue being run against some empty, you know, uh, directory. Generate a checksum. So invalidate that checksum every time you do a deployment. You know, I have a checksum in my database. Well, does it, does it val this new deployment that I did with these values, does it, you know, is it the same? If it's not, obviously something went wrong, right? Also check the file size. If you're, if you're expecting a 4K file and just, you know, 4.1K, guess what? Where's that 1K coming from? Is it a, some, did someone compromise your system and install something along with your source code, or with your package file? And all we, obviously, count the number of files that you have. If you're expecting five and you see six files in your deployment, something's up, right? And obviously, integrate with your change request systems and, and at the very end, notify everyone who's involved. Open up a JIRA ticket, do something, all automated within the pipeline. Securing the pipeline is part of is part of the solution. the The other part is obviously make is well, let me restate that. Securing the application is part of the solution, but securing your access to your pipeline is instrumental. Think about it. If your pipeline gets penetrated, what do they have access to? They have access to all your secure environments. They have access to ability to deploy anywhere, anytime. Right, your deployment mechanism, your supply chain. They have access to critical credentials to systems and cloud environments. So let's say you have, you're using, you kind of, maybe you hard coded, you shouldn't be hard coded. Let's say you hard coded your, your AWS credential keys and you're some sort of puppet or chef script. They have access to it. Now they can be spinning up machines under your account, doing whatever they want to do. And if you don't have an environment, environment management sort of a solution, you don't even know how many systems you have running in, a, in AWS. And obviously they have access to your, to your um, source code and you knew this was coming up next, a compromised pipeline can do all sorts of damage, not only to development, but obviously your business as well. So you cannot ignore security of your pipeline. There are too many examples of, of hacked pipelines and supply chains. I named one already. Um, pipelines obviously have access to sensitive data, but not only that, they, they have access to your production servers that are directly related to your, to your revenue, right? So understand how the process is built, is it using Jenkins or Team City, what third party plugins are being used, is my CI server compromised? So this is very important. Um, the CI server, let's say you're using Jenkins and you're using plugins, those plugins from third party. Do you know what libraries are being used in those plugins? Have you done a scan on your CI server to say, look, I don't know where this came from, but I need th this is what I need to spin up Docker containers. I'm not sure who the developer is, but it works, but how do you know that that particular plugin hasn't added any 
vulnerabilities into your environment. And of course, um, always store sensitive data in some sort of credential vault, encrypt it. And if you're going to access or use that, that information, parameterize your scripts, right? So, and maybe in CMDB or something and pull out that information during, uh, in, in, in real time rather than uh, it being hard coded. So, 80% of IT professionals surveyed believe that they haven't received adequate training to avoid behaviors that may lead to a breach. Um, this shouldn't be a surprise, but knowing this and not doing anything about it is pretty troublesome, right? You should employ in your pipeline role-based access, right? So you don't want developers having access to QA environments. You don't want to, you don't want QA people deploying into development environments or somewhere else. So scope out those environments using role-based. Um, another thing I, I would say is very important here is does everyone need access to all the machines that are being um, used in your deployment? Right? Have your pipeline be that single guarded point of access. So if you want to run a script, well, you have to use this pipeline or this process within the tool to run a script. That way you track who ran the script, what the results of those scripts were, and then you have an audit trail. So, so any, whenever something goes wrong, you know exactly what may have happened who, and what the results of those scripts were. And I'll, and I'll explain how the, why that's very important in a second. And try not to share environments between projects. And we'll talk about blast radius and why you don't want to do that in the next slide. Obviously, store your credentials in security vaults. Don't hard code values. Um, don't be a Viacom and store those values in some sort of publicly available FTP site or S3 you know, bucket where you and I can download and play around with it and have their movies or whatever downloaded and sent all over. But also, also constantly evaluate your open source libraries and tools. Create a policy. Look, if you want to install you know, Jenkins or Team City or any other open source tool, use this version because this version has been vetted and we know that it has no vulnerabilities and have some sort of tool that can actually identify, hey, you've You've actually installed a different version and flag it, notify the individuals or do something about it, right? Don't just let it stay there. Um, oh, well, we'll talk about that later, I guess. So leveraging, so your pipeline should be used to leverage the limit, um, your, I guess, limit the blast radius. So what is a blast radius, right? It's basically the range of exposure when things go wrong. For example, in development, active development, Let's say I add code or something in my active environment, and you don't want that code, which probably has the vulnerability in it, to affect QA, affect other projects. So how do you do that? You want to not share. So let's say you have project A, B, and C. Each project, maybe it should has, have its own credentials to AWS, right? Maybe each stage within the project should also have separate credentials as well. So that's one way. And we'll talk about some other ways, but let's talk about Docker for a minute. We talked a lot about containers and Docker's in this past couple of days. So if you're using Docker and you're not using any sort of security solution, you should really reconsider. Developers routinely are pulling down Docker images hosted on public registries like Docker Hub and using them as their base image for their applications, which are deployed in your environment. A recent analysis of Docker images on Docker Hub shows that 80% as 80% of the latest images, official images, contain at least one high severity vulnerability. So chances are you may already have compromised images in your ecosystem. So just like in the server world, IT operations would tell InfoSec or Info, well, actually, I, InfoSec will tell IT operations what images to install, what version of the operating system, what how to, how to, how to harden the images, what what um, libraries to install, et cetera, et cetera. Those same practices should be applied to the container and microservices world as well. Let your security team build and certify the base images and identify the libraries and packages that meet up to the policy standards. So here's an example of a pipeline in electric flow, for example. We have development, QA, and production. So within the development, we have these tasks. We notice the last task is, hey, Docker, image scan. 
So I'm building an application constantly in, in let's say, my environment. And I'm also doing a CI build. It's also building Docker images as well. Before I push anything, before I deploy anything, I want to make sure that this Docker image doesn't have a vulnerability. And it happens to be that this Docker image that I'm going to show in this example is MongoDB official latest that I pulled from Docker Hub. And guess what we found? We found at least three high, uh, high severity issues in this image. So the pipeline picked up on that and told me, we're going to fail this. It emailed me, he emailed the developer, it opened up a JIRA ticket saying this particular code commit caused this particular vulnerability and we're not gonna let this piece go any further, this pipeline go any further. So this piece, we we're talking about recovery. Um, how do you, so now that you found something in production, how do you fix that? What do you do? How do you reduce the mean time to recovery? So once an application is deployed into your environment, constantly monitor it. Because yes, you may not have a vulnerability today, but tomorrow, the next week, there may be a vulnerability. That CDE database may have gotten updated. So when you are constantly monitoring your production environment, you could pick up that, hey, Apache struts. So oh, this has a little vulnerability. Maybe I should do something about it. Notify whoever needs to be notified. OK, that's good. Notifications are good, but what if you actually have self-healing pipelines that can, that can automatically correct the issues in production or pre-prod? The goal of zero downtime auto patching is to reduce, obviously, mean time to recovery. Use a pipeline to monitor security scans and kick off a workflow when issues are found in production. For example, I found an issue. I open up a JIRA ticket, the pipeline, I being the pipeline, I open up a JIRA ticket. That JIRA ticket, I know exactly what code commit caused that vulnerability. I assign it to the, to the team and the developer, and then I monitor that ticket. When it's verified and proven and completed, I know now the artifacts in my artifact repository are ready to be deployed into my production, and I can start rolling into rolling deploy into my production environment, patching up those, those uh, vulnerabilities. And we're almost done. So this is another example of self-healing pipelines is that maybe you want to roll back artifacts. Maybe it was a you know, code commit that was done. Um, and that code commit added a vulnerability. But you took a snapshot of previous deployments, what version you, you deployed, how you deployed it. And you know that, hey, whenever there's a vulnerability in my environment, I want to roll back these environment or these particular artifacts to a previous snapshot. And, and this is, I like this one the most. So here's another one. This is our, um, a concept called artifact deposit uh, dependency, dependency tracker. So you're, you're deploying thousands of applications now, right? With, oh, across hundreds of teams. A vulnerability is found in some library. How can you identify all the applications, all the components, all the environments that are using this particular vulnerability or this particular library? And how can I then with a single click, automatically patch all those environments. You need to have reporting, you need to have insight into what's in your environments in order to do that. Your pipeline has all that information, it just, how do I save that information and recall it? And obviously audit and compliance, having an audit trail that identifies the source code, where the vulnerability was introduced is essential. It helps with remediation and reoccurrence. Um, a complete audit trail would have access to the logs, the test results, and give all the team members that were involved, developers, QA testers, approvers. And if, thing, if, and if, this, thing, and if, if this particular issue is reoccurring over and over again, maybe there's something wrong with your process, right? And if, and if that's the case, okay, well, it needs some enhancements. And this is where we go to the next um, section where we talk about what do I do, right? Security is an ongoing concern. So maintain your pipeline like a product. Continue to improve it, add new features to it, maintain a backlog, and obviously test it, and open issues like you would with any other product, right? If you're using Bugzilla or Jira to open up tickets in your, in your product right now, do the same thing with your pipeline. And of course, if you find any issues with it, treat it like any other product, apply the fix, test it again, and then make it available and how do you make it available? Once you identify common patterns in your pipeline, standardize on, standardize on those pipelines and make your pipelines reusable 
so it's easier to onboard new um, applications. So maybe create a self-service catalog, right? Where developers, QA, or release engineers, your DevOps, whoever, have access to vetted processes that comply with the organization's policies. This way, everyone who uses the same pipeline, or actually this way, everyone who uses the pipeline uses the pipelines that, have been, that follow or have mandatory guardrails in place and gates in place. So you don't have any, so you don't have to redo a lot of the stuff that's already been done, right? And I think that's the end. I did, I did, let me just leave this slide up. So if there are any, any questions. So this is a checklist I put together. So just in case, or oh, this it's gonna be available for you guys anyway, so you, so you can download. But the first step was obviously to kind of evaluate where am I? In my, how is my pipeline at the moment? How secure is my pipeline? Can anyone go into my pipeline, my Jenkins pipeline, can they start changing things around? Or do I have security around it that won't allow anyone to do that? Um, we've seen so many times where I, and as a solution architect, I do POCs. So I say, listen, we need access to this, this, and this. Anyone and everyone we work with has access to that and can change the pipeline for us. We're like, well, should that be the case? Or should there be some sort of role-based access that, I'll, this, that doesn't allow anyone to do anything, right? Um, and this is one of those things that, you know, as a community, we need to kind of come together and figure out, you know, what is the best practice so we don't become the next Equifax or, you know, Viacom or whatever other company. So I'm done. Any questions? <laughs> I have three minutes. Thank you. I know this was a lot to talk within 30 minutes, but um, I try to hit all the points at a very high level. So perhaps if there's some thoughts, it may have, maybe it's a catalyst to a thought. Maybe you could start thinking about, you know, do, should I be doing this? Should I not be doing this? Am I doing security scans on my Docker images? Am I not? Um, I hope um, it kind of starts, starts, starts you guys to start thinking about things like that. Cool? Thank you.